Okay. Is there a video you yeah, understand? Yeah, we have a short video. video that's called Symphony of Time. Inside the scientist speaking about how time is an illusion. It's really like, you know, deep. And then they put music to it. It's really nice. <coughs> Beautiful. Yeah. Well, that really encapsulates what we're dealing with in the world. It's this uh, egoic injection of these memories that appear as shadows from the past. So that's why it takes such a, an effort for mind training with these shadows coming up to try to convince the mind of guilt. That's why they were made. And they just keep coming and coming and coming until we don't want them to come anymore. I had a man who contacted me, wrote me a letter named Dale, in prison for, for murdering a man. He was in prison for many years, but he started to read my books and read the course and and go through such a it's such a passion and a willingness to to heal and to forgive that he ultimately started teaching other uh, cellmates uh, having to face things that he was not expecting even the the sister of the man that he murdered wanted to come and, and meet him and he wrote to me saying, what should I do? I said, meet her. This is your, your chance to, to really go past all the darkness and fear that you've had and, and to release yourself. So that was a huge healing experience too when the sister of the man that he murdered came and, and he just kept going and going and going and then eventually uh, now he's, he's part of a, of a group that uh, are able to see movies and use uh, the Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment, use uh, Course in Miracles lessons, and it's turned into this big ministry. And it kind of spurred things on so that now uh, there's an aspect of our community that, that has a prison ministry that they're just getting a lot of our teachings um, they've been approved to be put in all prisons in the United States. <laughs> it started with this one man, you know, dealing with this darkness, and now it's just grown and grown and grown and grown. And it just shows that it's, it's, it's a willing mind that needs to see things differently is what it's all about. And you can see how convinced uh, O'Brien was here, just from those few hours of um, dark memories that were imprinted. And then it was as if he lived through them, and as if he concluded that he was, he was bad, and that he, he murdered a friend, and you know, it just went on and on and on to, to uh, the ego's death wish of, you know, suicide or death or whatever, but uh, it just shows how, how mesmerizing it is, these shadows of the past, and how it takes a lot of vigilance to, to not succumb to the perceptions and the interpretations. It's very sweet. Just think of it as an imprint. Mm. Like, you actually imprinted our memories. They never happened. And you could put them there. They never happened. Yeah. But then, um, yeah, I mean, when he kind of mistreated his child, and I could <coughs> hit her. Yeah, I don't know. Was... Yeah, we did watch before this, <clears throat> as a run up to this retreat, we watched uh, the island. And there was memory implants in that movie too, where all the, the memories uh, were were imprinted, and uh, the clinics believe that, that they were all real memories, that they've been re living real lives, and everything it was all just programming. So this was kind of a real concentrated emotion. That's what showed it in there. 
could see the darkness that he was leaving him and how he had to be shown. Why do people have resistance to I trust my brothers that are wrong with me. And they have all those internal attacks. All those attack thoughts, all those memories of of evidence for mistrust, yeah. But it takes such a, a rinsing of the mind, such a washing of the mind. Yeah, it's quite, quite strong. Very interesting uh, little piece, you know, to reinforce the, the darkness. And then you have to break out of it. Even though he had his friends trying to help him, his interpretation was quite dark. He didn't pull out of it. And interestingly enough, he didn't really want help. He kept refusing help, even though the help kept coming. And the offers of help just kept coming, coming, coming. He just more and more closed off. So it's like a little, a little synopsis of temptation. It's the whole thing is set up to, to, to get into temptation by the temptation. Well, that was our trip through guilt. Yeah. Yeah. I also was touched by how it was acted out that as long as he wasn't facing the guilt, he had to like kind of, it was, it was acted out. Like he started yelling at his child and you know, uh, smashing these cans and you could really see the effect of not facing or wanting to face the guilt. It's just, yeah. Driving you insane. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's like it was generating this whole perception yeah. of darkness, no escape, and yeah. and of hiding, and and really of denial, saying no, I want it over now, but he didn't want to do any of the steps that were offered to him. <laughs> I want it over now, you know, but it was more of a defense, like a denial. Strong. I feel it really, yeah, that projection, you know, we actually don't hear, we don't hear the Christ through our brother, we don't hear it until we have forgiven completely, but until then we just hear our own projection, you know, if someone says something to us, even if it's very, very loving, we won't hear it, you know, I have experienced that a lot, but share something with someone and they, you know, seem to react or as if I had said something else. It's very, yeah, like projection, like when the guilt is there, when the past is not forgiven, it is, that's all we see, like we did. It's all. Interesting, there's another Star Trek that's coming to mind. And this one, it seemed like it was clearly O'Brien and everyone else was his friends and his, his wife and child and everything. And he was the one pointing to it individually. We do, there is another Star Trek episode called Waking Moments, which is really showing more that everyone who is asleep and dreaming, is dreaming a private world. And that this private world, there is no meeting point. So everyone is literally in their own hallucination of a private world, and that's where all the conflict comes in. And Jesus is teaching us, minds are joined. He says in the workbook, you have no private thoughts, and yet that's all that your mind believes in. And, and so it, it gives a, a bit of a perspective on that when there's, when the mind is asleep and dreaming that, that it seems from every person that there's a, a world happening, that there's no overlap where there's some shared points that, that seem to make it uh, into something that's real, but actually the, that no two people see the same world and everybody's generating a world that's based on the past and there, that's why there is no uh, joining. It's, it's kind of designed by the ego to be a hopeless trap that is a closed loop that's inescapable and 
only through the Holy Spirit's lessons of forgiveness and lessons of healing does the mind escape this kind of ingeniously designed uh, plan where everybody seems to be dreaming a dream, but, but sure that, that what they're seeing is reality. It, except it's seen in this world that, that people perceive the world differently and the only thing that makes it seem real is that there's some shared aspects of it. That makes it even worse. Yeah. Than the dreams is real. Yeah, it makes it seem like it's external. Mm -hmm. Like there's no responsibility for the dreaming of the world. But that's one we hadn't talked about, but I feel like that could be one to follow this up with, called Waking Moments. Because it's, it's clearly shown that, that, that it's a, a hallucination, even though uh, nobody who's dreaming the, the world wants to admit that it's just a dream. <coughs> It's clearly shown in the episode that that's exactly what's what's happening, what's going on. Oh, we have to go to the magic silver box. <laughs> First spontaneous friend of ours. <laughs> It's in this episode where I think it's the character Helix. Helix, who basically says um, about the dreams, maybe we're all dreaming. And none of this is real. <laughs> but so he's kind of bringing in the, the, the line from the Course. It's, it's a dream, it's a hallucination. Waking but moments. Waking moments. Do we have something? It's the, the crew encounters a species who, who doesn't overtly attack them, he just puts the crew to sleep. <laughs> That's what the attack is. <laughs> it's not seeing it so as an overt attack. They just all start falling asleep. And, uh, and then they start losing crew members one by one as uh, the whole crew starts falling asleep, which is Quite an interesting proposition. <laughs> so now you get to see the ego's chief weapon. It's, it's not weapons as we know it, it's not attack and defense as we know it, but the ego's weapon is sleep through private minds, private thoughts, and private dreams. It's a sneaky attack, because we're used to attack being physical, but this is a mental attack. Sleep, private minds, private thoughts, private dreams. Where when you're dreaming with the ego, you perceive a world that's being generated from an illusion of a private mind, which is associated with the body, with private thoughts, which you think are just your own, and nobody can know exactly what they are, that's why we have secrets, and private dreams, everyone perceiving a, a private world, and there is actually seeming some areas of overlap, but, but no two people see the same world. So, it seems to be 6.8 billion private dreams on planet Earth, going on simultaneously. And then you wonder, why is there world peace? Why is there struggle in relationships? Why is there struggle in communities? It's as many people as you have, that's how many private perspectives you have. Because it's, it's generated by private thoughts, and Jesus says that in the workbook. You have no private thoughts, and yet that is all you are aware of. Your ego has built a trap that doesn't seem to have an external enemy, but it's the very perspective, when you're looking through the personhood, the, through the five senses, 
the very perspective, the very private perspective is the trap. And that's why we have expression sessions. And even today, this morning, we had expression sessions and and some were sharing, Peter was sharing, the other ones were sharing. I feel better after I've exposed some thoughts and feelings I was holding on to. That's the beginning of the undoing of the belief in private minds, private thoughts, private emotions, and private perspectives. So here they are, they thought they were just going to go to the edge of this quadrant and be allowed to move forward. But now they say, no, your, your ship, uh, we're going to take the ship and, and they simply all come and manifest on the ship. And, and Janeway and her, her crew have never experienced that. This, this one didn't involve weapons, they just simply manifested on the ship and none of their weapons worked. So now they're dealing with some form of attack that they've never ever experienced. It's not like it's a, it seems to be a species, but, but somehow it seems to be that they've dreamt it and invited it. And in one sense, that's what the ego is. The ego is there by invitation. You, you made this world by believing in it, you made the ego by believing in it, and Jesus says you can dispel it by withdrawing your belief from it. Withdrawing your belief from the ego means withdrawing your belief from private minds, private thoughts, private emotions, and private perspectives. You see how devious it is. It's not so much like a, a house intruder where you call the police. This is a, an imprisonment of the mind based on something that God doesn't know about. God doesn't know about private minds, private thoughts, private emotions, or private perceptions. Mm -hmm. God knows nothing, but it's like an internal dream state in which no two people can have complete agreement. You know, even you could have the soulmates, and then one day they wake up, the soulmates wake up, you believe what? <laughs> you feel what? <laughs> that's, that's popping the whole idea of soulmates uh, at some point. Because in the end there isn't two, there's only one. And even twin flames always hit that point. It's the, it's the sticking point of private minds, private thoughts, private emotions, private perceptions. So now it gets fascinating because they don't know what's going on and they don't know exactly how they're going to uh, deal with this. Because they just manifested a whole group of the species on their ship instantaneously. And uh, they, they don't seem to have a, a, a solution at this point. He sees the moon. His training is telling him that the whole scene that they're witnessing right now is only a dream. Because of his lucid dreaming training. Oh. Is, is, uh, with his tribe, because he uses the moon as the symbol to, in the dream, to tell him that he's only dreaming, and they're only dreaming. So when he looks out and sees the moon, you can see the look on his eyes, like, aha! <laughs> and you know how when you're dreaming a nighttime dream and everything seems real, and if, if you don't know that you're dreaming the dream, and it's a nightmare, it seems very, very real. And you might find, you might, if you do wake up, you find your heart pounding and sweating, because you know, because you're reacting, you're interpreting the dream as if it's reality. And it seems very, very real in, in lucid detail. And now he's just looked out the window and seen the moon, and he's like, wait a minute, this whole scenario of them coming on the ship, and, and the, the crew, and all these people, and everything that he's witnessing is, is just a dream. So they're all asleep, they're all dreaming, they're all having the same dream, but it, it's not really, it doesn't, it, they can't have any agreement, and it just seems like it's real. And that's what this perceptual world is, it seems like it's an it's an actuality. 
And the ego is so ingenious, it has invented this trap for the mind with private minds, private thoughts, private emotions, and, and private perspectives that it seems like all of the individuals have their own perspective of location, and their own special perspective, their own location in the dream, their own identification with their own body, and it seems like there are multiple people, but it's all just a generated dream. But all the people think their their version of what they're perceiving is is real. So that's how sneaky the trap is. And now, uh, Tuvok, you know, is in part of it all the way, but Shakoti is like just taking steps because he was the one that was saying we need to face face it in our mind, we need to face it in our dreams. And we've got a lot of theories and a lot of practice with Carl Jung and a lot of people who would do shadow work and dream work, but, but what we're learning from Jesus is it's the, it's the ego belief, and the belief in private minds, private thoughts, private emotions, and private perspectives that is the problem. It's generating a hallucination where it's a hallucination of separation where everybody seems to be inside their own body. Even though the movie we watched was showing us that consciousness, we need symbols like uh, the, the movie we watched, first of all he, he realized that he wasn't the person that he thought he was, and then he realized he wasn't in the location that he thought he was, and then he realized that he was actually dead, uh, had been dead for two months, and so that was throwing it more into consciousness, and then he had to discover the, the connectedness, that if he followed his heart, he could dream a different way, dream a dream in which there was a, a dream of healing, a dream of connectedness, where he prevents seemingly disaster. So here we are in this movie, and they're just confronted with an enemy now, uh, like the old Poco, you know, cartoon, we have we have, uh, we have encountered the enemy and it is us. In. in other words, the enemy is in the mind. It's not an external enemy, it's a belief in the mind that's generating this whole faulty, fragmented perception. So here we go, let's see what they're going to do. <laughs> they're going to have a conversation coming up. That this is going to be one of the best conversations you've ever seen in your life because they're beginning to start to question what is going on? Maybe we're not. And not what? Interacting with one another. No. Oh my God. What if we're not really interacting with each other? What if all of our guilt comes from believing in the shadow figures and the belief we're interacting with each other and not doing the right things, not doing enough, not speaking up enough, not talk, talking up, you see? It's a belief, it's a hallucination in which there seems to be an interaction going on and, and Neelix is saying, maybe we're not. They're like, not what? Interacting with each other. Oh, our psychology class has never <laughs> prepared us for that. That was not an option in psychology class. But if you actually look at the workbook lessons of A Course in Miracles, what's the first lesson? Nothing I see means anything. Lesson number two, I have given everything I see all the meaning it has for me. So what if the world that I'm perceiving through this distorted ego lens is just the projection of private thoughts that only exists in a mind that believes in the ego, and the entire cosmos, including all the people in it, are all just projections of private thoughts. And as long as I hold on to those private thoughts and I don't expose them to the light, I keep recycling and perceiving problems where there are none. I, and they, believe me, those problems seem to be very, very interpersonal. Everyone who talks about relationship problems, 
talks about interpersonal relationship problem. Everyone who talks about relationship issues with their, with, within themselves, with their partners, with their families, with their co-workers, with their bosses, with their communities, it's all seen as this hodgepodge of issues that just regurgitate and repeat over and over and over. And Jesus is saying, it's all a wrong-minded perception. The reason you're guilty is because you're perceiving the world through a wrong-minded perception, through an egoic perception. And it's put all the thoughts out there to act out as shadow figures. That's what that section, we went over it before the retreat started, but it was chapter 17, section 3, Shadows of the Past. And it's describing in Shadows of the Past that every Thing that you perceive, all the characters, are all representing some past thought that you haven't released. So when you think you have issues with the person that you think you are, which is, there's a lot of judgments on that, that's a shadow figure, and so are all the other people's shadow figures, and they're all acting out the past. Which Jesus is telling us is over and done, it's been, it's been solved. But as long as I hold on to those private thoughts, then I perceive them acted out as, as bodies. And then I, I react and respond to those bodies as if they're real. You let me down, you lied to me, you cheated, you did, you know, all these things that we think we have all the evidence for, and all of our evidence is part of this distorted perceptual world. So you can see how sneaky the setup is, it's, it's always a faulty perception that is generating the guilt. And it, the solution is always a miracle, of always a right-minded perspective, which is basically what our Captain Coulter came to, you know, he had, he kept reacting and reacting to, to those eight, was it eight minute or <laughs> inter intervals, he kept reacting and reacting until he didn't anymore, until he just had the smile on his face, and he just joined with Christina, and he was in that, I did everything I was supposed to do, and, and I'm, I'm finished, I'm, I'm done. Uh, he, he did come back with a question to Christina, what would you do if you just had a minute to, to live, and you know, she was just basically saying, you know, live it, enjoy it. And he came back to that relaxed point of view, and then everything came, symbols of laughter, the f photograph of everyone laughing, and then, and then it's just this happy, spontaneous, new way of looking at the world came about. But that's why Jesus says in lesson number 23, I can escape from the world I see, I can escape from this dark, perceptual world of fragmented perception by giving up attack thoughts. And those attack thoughts are just private thoughts. He's actually telling us in the workbook, in the early lessons, you have no private thoughts and yet, that's all that you are aware of. God didn't create private thoughts. God doesn't create hundreds and thousands and millions and billions of personal perspectives. Where's the unity? And that, if we're all one mind, if we're one Christ. But you can see how devious the ego is, as it's just a belief in the mind, and it's just a filter that is showing this uh, hallucination. And once you look through that filter, you've bought the bait. You know, then the defensiveness comes in, then the attack and defense, all the defense mechanisms are activated once I believe that there's someone who's dangerous, who's not myself. Someone who could harm me, who's not myself. And Jesus is saying, no, you have to start to see, it's, it's your own attack thoughts that is generating this hallucination where it seems like there's external attacks. People who don't love me, people who treat me poorly, mistreat me, other people, you know, it can be countries, it can be neighbors, you know, we were talking here, come here, the neighbors sometimes play their music very loud. Yeah, 
during retreats. <laughs> Especially during retreats. <laughs> right. And Jesus is saying, yeah, those are your attack lights. Yeah. That's, that's why we're having the retreats. <laughs> to forgive the attack lights, you see. He's, he's telling us you have to do it from the inside. It's I not... thinking of the line, you are the dream of the world of dreams. No other cause does it have or ever will. Yeah, that's what Jesus is saying. Mm -hmm. You are the dreamer of the world of dreams. No other cause does it have or ever will. So here they are. Look at this conversation. Chakoti said, you know, he was dreaming, Balama says, and right away they get into this big debate. And, and Neelix is saying, but she, uh, she's saying, how can, but how are we interacting with, the, with each other? And he's saying, maybe we're not. <laughs> and she's like, maybe we're not what? Interacting with each other. <laughs> Neelix is like on to the whole thing. <laughs> like, if this is a dream, maybe we're not really interacting with each other. Maybe it just seems like we're having a conversation here, but we're not really having this conversation. It's just a, a projection of private thoughts, and it seems like a conversation between separate beings. They have their own minds, their own emotions, their own thoughts, but it's a projection. It's a sneaky, holographic projection <laughs> in which all of the parts seem to be real. And the whole is missed. The whole is not seen, but the parts seem to be very real. And you see, it's an impossible situation. If, if you see, see it that way, then the ego is, is just sitting back, and the unconscious mind smiling, going, I've got you in a prison, and you have no idea, because you believe there's an external enemy. Mm -hmm. You are reacting and responding to people as if they're apart from you. You believe you have a private thought, and they have a private thought, that you have a private mind, they have a private mind, and your two private minds do not agree. <laughs> Or they may only agree sometimes, and then a lot of times they disagree, and that's when it's like a war. It's a, it's a struggle. So here we go, <laughs> let's see. Balan is about, she's really uh, getting filled up with this idea that, that it's just a dream. Hey. So that exposed the private minds, private thoughts, private emotions, private perspective. If we have time, we could watch one more. <laughs> Actually exposes the ego, the ego belief system, instead of putting it off onto a sleeping species. We have one called the thaw, that actually exposes the ego. The one who, who initiated the, the sleep and who is part of a, of a generated false world that it hides itself and threatens the ones who believe they're in it with, with fear of death to escape. And everyone in this world is so preoccupied with fear of their body dying, which puts them in this crazy pattern of survival and doing meaningless jobs, meaningless things, going to a medical system to try to prolong the body, and yet the body is not really, the, the survival of the body is, is a trick that the mind, ego is using to keep the mind from going inside to forgive and be still. We read earlier this line. Uh, if problems are perceived, thought of bodies must have entered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the trick. It's, it's these shadow figures that yeah. the mind is completely preoccupied. It's the experience of the timeline. It does generate fear, the whole idea that all well, this is a dream. Because I remember as a little boy, I actually had the fearful thoughts that I was in a coma, in a hospital and that my whole life was a dream. And I basically telling me that is true. <laughs> yeah, so it's really making me emotional. <laughs> yeah. That was like, like a, 
abreast with reality. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But it's, it's also what people experience when they go into meditation. I mean, one of the, the pathways on earth right now that, that is kind of known for going very, very, very deep within and, and going into the silence and going to God through meditation is Vipassana. Some of you have heard of the Vipassana retreats. One time I remember, maybe about six or seven years ago, uh, Francis sent me an article and in it, it was the, the, the founders of Vipassana, mm -hmm. uh, the founders of Vipassana all would meet every year back in Thailand and they would share their meditation notes. These are the Vipassana masters would all meet in Thailand and they would share their notes. And when they would share their notes, they would say, yeah, I went deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into my mind. And then all of them reported the same experience. They hit a wall of fear. That was astounding, it was staggering that they had couldn't believe it. And they all reported the same wall of fear when they went deep enough into their mind. These are the Vipassana masters hitting that. And Jesus says in the Course that there, he calls it the ring of fear. There's a ring of fear that's in the mind, that's very deep, and it's like, it's, it's a protective device for the ego. It's, it's almost like, okay, you want to still your mind? Well, you can only go to this far. And then the protective device is like a ring of fear guarding the ego, guarding the uncovery of it. So obviously Jesus is the symbol of one who had to go back and go down past the ring of fear you know, 40 days in the desert, temptations and all the things that are talked about in the Bible was really just passing that dark ring of fear. It's a protective uh, device that, that's guarding the ego. But this next one, this is one of the most famous uh, Star Trek episodes. This, in this case, they're going to talk about uh, a group of people that seem to have put themselves to sleep to weighed out a planetary a disaster and they, they use a computer generated world, an artificial world, to uh, weight out the disaster. And so they, they put themselves to sleep into an artificial world. And when Captain Janeway and her crew come to this planet, they, they go searching for these people to see if there's life signs and life forms. And they, they bury themselves in under the surface in, in the planet and they are using a computer generated world. And, and, but the planetary disaster is over. So Captain Janeway says they should have woken up years ago. They should have just woken themselves up. They put themselves to sleep. They should have woken themselves up. And then she asked about, what, is there something wrong with their wake-up mechanism? And then they say, no. It's like Jesus is saying, we have been long delayed. It's yeah, yeah. The, the wake-up mechanism, they put themselves to sleep, and the wake-up mechanism is still active and still functioning. But for some strange reason, they are not using the wake-up mechanism. So the wake-up mechanism is the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but for some strange reason, <laughs> even though the wake-up mechanism is still active and still functioning, it's not being used. Mm -hmm. So that's why it makes this next episode so great. I suppose we can watch it. This is the one that really exposes the ego and, and its techniques for keeping the mind asleep through Fear, through a, a lot of fear. Yeah. No, we know. Just three taps. <laughs> <laughs> they were trying. They were all were trying that. Janeway was trying. That. We're all tapping. That. Yeah. Well, the key points are: the people put themselves to sleep using an artificial environment. The wake up. A mechanism is still active and working, but they are not using it. 
to release themselves from the artificial environment. And then, you know, what, why are they still in there? Why aren't they using the wake-up mechanism? Neelix comes up with the, the first thing, maybe they like it in there. <laughs> maybe they like it in there. Maybe there's pleasure. Maybe there's some kind of distortion going on inside the artificial environment where they like it in there. And then the other hypothesis is fear, extreme fear. <laughs> So those are the two things that are mentioned in the round table discussion there. Maybe they like it in there, which Jesus would call in the course attraction to guilt, attraction to fear, attraction to death. He's actually saying the ego has generated a system where you like the artificial environment and you believe it would be a sacrifice to give up the artificial world. And then the other is extreme fear, the fear of losing individuality, losing the familiar, losing your identity. So those are, are giving the main reasons for why they haven't used the wake-up mechanism. It's activated, it's active, it's still working, but it's not being used. So now they're sending in two crew members to go inside the artificial world. and. You know, the main thing for the crew members is they're going in there to try to find out what's going on in the world, but, but it's like the power of suggestion and hypnotism. You don't want to get lost in a nightmare <laughs> if you're going on a search and, and rescue mission and you're going in to collect data. The last thing you want to do in an artificial world is believe in it. <laughs> so, this is going to be one of the big temptations, but... I'm thinking. No, it's, it, she says, but none of this is real. And then it comes back with fear. Mm. And so when fear is generated, then fear gives reality to that which has no reality. Because that's what fear's purpose is. Is to not only generate unreality, but to cover itself. So that it protects itself from being exposed and, and released. So the ego character there, you know, is just, a, this character is kind of a manifestation of, of these unconscious fears, but, but it will always threaten the body. That you can see, uh, threaten the body, if, if you leave, one of them will die. The threat is always the death of the body. Because the ego made the body up, and now it's going to use the body as a pawn to say, this is who you are, and you can't leave because you'll, you'll die. Or it's really just a projection of the belief in sacrifice. Like, to return to who you really are is going to cost you something, is basically what the ego is saying. And many people who have been on the spiritual journey, you know, have, have believed it's a path of a sacrifice. Many people, many ascetics who have lived a life of asceticism, Try to, to self-flagellation of the body, starving the body, you know, doing, torturing the body as a way to try to escape this world. It's a subtle way of making the error real, and it doesn't result in escape. But here in this little skip we're seeing here, that's what the ego is using, is, is fear of harm to the body. Uh, and that's one aspect of it, and then we'll see coming up pretty soon here too, Again, the ego uses past memories, because these past memories are all dark shadows. Like the very first Star Trek episode we watched with O'Brien, how it just used all these dark memories to dispirit, you know, to make the mind feel very dark and guilty, like it was incapable of rising up, and incapable of escaping. And he, the ego would use that against Harry as well when he is determined to escape and to, to have everybody escape with him, then the ego will bring in past memories as a way to combat the, the attempt to wake up. So you can see with her attempting to try a compromise approach, she said if we can't remove the hostages from the environment, we can try to remove the environment from the hostages. 
and it will be a matter of, of race against time. The only thing is, the ego is in charge of all of us. The ego is in charge of the bodies, the characters, and the environment that the characters seem to exist in, and time as well. The ego invented all that. So, to try to uh, plan an escape with just part of the system is a compromised approach. So that's why Jesus is teaching us in the Course, only salvation can be said to cure. Only enlightenment will work. Only atonement is the only correction that will transcend the ego. You don't try to hate the ego, attack the ego, you don't try to dissemble its system, and many people have tried with the, the construct of the world, and the body, and, and the defense mechanisms, and even time itself, but they're all part of the same thing. Time and space are part of the illusion, the environment of, of the body, and the body itself is all part of the same projection. So there is no bargaining or compromising to try to escape using a piecemeal approach, or an approach a little bit here, a little bit there, as Captain Janeway is saying, we can maybe distract the, the ego character and then remove the environment from the hostages, but, but the whole system is all one thing. So that's why the whole teaching is, you train your mind with miracles to accept the atonement. And then, instead of trying to attack the ego, or conquer the ego, or defeat the ego, it's always about exposing the ego to release the ego. Exposing the private thoughts to release the private thoughts. Exposing the attack thoughts to release the attack thoughts. Exposing the error, here we are, are our whole theme is, do not see error. Expose the error by bringing the darkness to the light, to the Holy Spirit, and, and seeing the nothingness of the entire error and the entire system, including lesson number one, nothing I see means anything. But there's no way to transcend the ego in a piecemeal approach. It has to be literally all or nothing. And he even says that in the Course. This Course will be believed entirely, or not at all. It's not like a 99.9% .9 approach, like, okay, I, I'm close, am I close enough? Yeah. Jesus says, no, no scrap, as long as a prisoner remains to walk the world, as long as there's a projection of the error in any way, shape, or form, then that, that means that the error is, is intact in the mind. There's still a, a shred of belief in the ego, then the entire system remains intact, with just a shred of belief. So, so it's definitely a non-compromising approach, and most people who work with the Course, they get that feeling like, wow, this seems extremely non-compromising. Page after page, workbook lesson after workbook lesson, everything seems like it's all or nothing. And yeah, this course will be believed entirely or not at all. So here she's tried this, uh, to use the doctor, the android doctor, who's not uh, on the ego system. It, it, he doesn't, he's not human. Just like in the last episode we watched, he was the one that didn't fall asleep. <laughs> because he, he, he wasn't human, he doesn't dream. <laughs> he's a machine. So in both episodes, there's an attempt this one, uh, Janeway is trying to use the doctor as a messenger to distract the ego while she tries to remove the, through the optonic pathways with the line of piece by piece. But this scene right here is just showing us the piece by piece approach won't work because the ego will be aware of, of anything that's trying to uh, defeat it. And the only way is to expose it completely to the light. So here we see uh, another attempt to try to defeat or bargain with the ego, it doesn't work. And if you try to compromise with the ego, that doesn't work either. It likes a fight. It likes a battle. <laughs> it's, it's looking for a battle. Yeah. But she's just saying to the ego, this is really like the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit on the system 
but not in the environment. <laughs> Just like Jesus was, he seemed to be in the environment, but the Christ never enters into matter. And the Holy Spirit can use the images that the ego made, but it never enters in. It's not in the environment. It's the Holy Spirit, Jesus says in the Course, he, he, see, he looks past the defiled altar to the light of truth and stays fixated on the light. So the Spirit, Holy Spirit can use the symbols to teach their own reality, but it never enters into the ego world. The ego has, has used the power of the mind to project a world, project an environment, but in that sense the Word was never made flesh, that, that the Word of God is the Christ, and the Christ never did come into time and space. But Jesus was just a, a symbol that the Holy Spirit could use to speak our kingdom is not of this world. I'm calling you out of the world. It was the, it was the universal voice, of the Holy Spirit, that was using, speaking through Jesus. So when Jesus, the voice of the Holy Spirit said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. That wasn't a man speaking. That was the Holy Spirit speaking. And the Holy Spirit is not on this system. The Holy Spirit can use everything the ego made, but the Holy Spirit never, light never enters into darkness. It's just the presence that says, bring everything, bring all your darkness to the light and it will disappear. So that's basically what Captain Janeway is saying. You know, he, he's saying, oh, we're going to spend eternity here together. The special love relationship, the ego fell for its greatest trick, and then she says, I'm not Captain Janeway. Could have fooled me. I'm afraid I did. <laughs> so, you know, she, she said, I'm on the, on the system, and in other words, I'm connected. Spirit can use all of this, but I'm, but I'm not in stasis. Stasis is sleep. I'm not asleep. And that's what Jesus came to realize. Oh, I'm awake. I've, I'm, I've transcended the world. Be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. I'm not in stasis. I'm not, not asleep. And that's what Janeway is doing here. Tried bargaining, uh, out, outwitting the ego. No, it didn't work, didn't work, didn't work. And then finally, you know, just having the ego think that, uh, that he, you know, the ego thought that he had Jesus, but he never had the Christ. <laughs> he, never had, he never had the Christ that seemed to try to, in his world, kill, crucify Jesus. But, but again, that's a body, you know, it's something that ego made and it was trying to use the, the body of Jesus for its own purposes, death. But the Christ is the I Am Presence. Before Abraham was, I Am. Before time, before the ego, before the system of the ego, I am. So this is a beautiful, uh, beautiful little Star Trek, <laughs> yeah. showing, showing how to transcend the ego entirely. <laughs> there we go. Bravo! Yeah. Blowing us away. <laughs> Holy Spirit, she's some Star Trek. Julie signed up. Oh! Even <laughs> answer the call for love. Getting to you for the movie gathering, call and text and I know nothing. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, this was at the, at the symphony. This is the crescendo. <laughs> or do not see her. She was not. Janeway was determined not to uh, fall into the air. <laughs> In the end, you know, she, she tricked me. I know. <laughs> What, what was Ego's last word? Dread. 
Regrets, yeah. Right. G R A T. It's kind of like a regrets, right? Regretting something. Yeah, yeah. regretting something. Yeah. I think it sounds like a like a, a phrase from Batman or something. Yeah. You know, <laughs> Robin. Yeah. Like damn. Yeah. 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 Sorry. 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 It's a soft word for damn. <laughs> 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 it's it's a sense of admitting defeat. <laughs> yeah, the ego has to admit defeat. Couldn't. But it's this. even fierce its own existence. So this whole universe was generated out of fear of your own existence. Yeah. Yeah. To the light. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's the your light. real existence. Yeah. yeah. Incredible. Tiny melody. Yeah. And the Borg had a had a good say in the, in Star Trek. Apparently, that resistance is futile. Mm. And in one sense, Jesus is saying, resistance is futile. You, know, you, can, you can resist the light, but not forever. Because uh, light is truth, and therefore light is inevitable. So resistance is futile. Borg had one, <laughs> yeah. one good saying there. <laughs> Properly applied. <laughs> not, not that they will overtake you through fear, but yeah. Resistance to the light is true. When I woke up this morning, I had the movie It in my mind. Is that my favorite scene the movie It? No, I don't. You know the evil, evil clown, and he he appears in the people's dreams, and he like their worst fears manifest, you know, and he uses their their fears against them, and so they have to learn how to be fearless and, and to face their worst fears and overcome, overcome them. That was just on my mind. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to say yeah. themes, really. Yeah. Just saw it. yeah, yeah. That's it. That's, that was like our theme, it, using the fear, using the memories too, mm -hmm. using the made up false memories, like in the first, first episode, which was all just, you know, imprinted memories, and then those memories were used to just generate all this fear. And in the end, none of those memories were real. So, so in the end, we don't really have a good reason to be afraid. It's what we're learning. Because yeah. the ego was, even Harry was trying to use the, the thing that, uh, I think Franklin Delano Roosevelt was the President of the United States who had that, coined that phrase, the only thing to fear is fear itself. So he was trying to use it almost like an affirmation to dispel the ego through that affirmation. And the ego jumped right in. The only thing to fear is fear itself. <laughs> yes. All the characters are like, so it's like, you're not going to take me out with an affirmation. You need more than that. You need the light. You need to really see the nothingness. Have it dispelled. Yeah. You know? that's, that's the way. Yeah. Is, is it in, in the mind training or? Um, we, we were lifting the hand at the same time. Go. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. This, uh, this feeling that in, 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 you're in the mind training and increasingly mind mind training, that the, this fear increases as well, like in my experience. So it's really um, trying to stay or to, to stay alive, yeah, and to really. Um, yeah, with, with um, all ideas to go back, to hold, to hold on, and um, really coming from, from deeper now, um, around nearly everything, right? so it's, it's this whole world um, seems uh, sometimes very fearful. This ring of fear, approaching approaching the light of this this ring of fear, this shield of fear, <coughs> and of guilt. It's it's a lot about guilt, right? To throw guilt. Yeah, it's like the mystics' journey that you know Buddha said, "Empty your mind of everything you think you think you think you know." 
Jesus is saying the same thing in Lesson 189. Simply do this, be still, lay aside all thoughts of what you are, what God is, hold on to nothing, do not bring with you one thought, the past is taught. And he does say that in the text, that salvation is nothing more than the escape from concepts. So, as you begin to question everything about the personality self and the environment that is surrounding the personality self, then, you know, you're questioning every value that you hold and you're questioning this image, this idol image, this concept that's been made to take the place of the truth. This concept that's been made to take the place of the Christ. You keep questioning it, questioning it, questioning it. And that's described too in the stages of the development of trust. Where you go through all these stages, four out of the six are difficult or unsettling. You know, two-thirds of the stages of the development of trust are difficult. That, that shows that we're, we have to go through the darkness to the light. It's not like two-thirds are pleasant and one-third or one-fifth or <laughs> one-sixth or something. No, it's, it's two, two out of three you have to go through that. But in the end, you know, he says you must reach a state that can take a long, long, long time. You just have to ask with every circumstance, every situation, what is it that I truly want? You have to just hold out. What is it, Holy Spirit, that you that is helpful for me in this situation? Seemingly in a number of situations, but you keep have to ask over and over, what is it for? What is what is your will? Father, what is your will? Father, what is your will? Over and over and over and over with every situation to transfer the training past all of the exceptions, you know, like, and the ego is like trying to pull out, find a distraction or something that glimmers or something that the mind will grab onto to hold onto the whole construct. And Jesus says, no, no, don't hold on to nothing, just keep asking, what is it for? In every situation, what is it for? So in one sense, it's kind of just like let, abandoning the self-concept entirely, where you just, you're praying to be truly helpful, truly helpful in every seeming situation. And the ego will be screaming at this point, because it's like you're going like through the wall of fear. You're, you're going through the last defense yeah. for seeing it's, it's the ego's non-existence. You know, seeing past the, it's like in the Wizard of Oz, you know, Toto runs out of Dorothy's arms and pulls the curtain. <laughs> Wizard's there trying to make this big thing on the screen and magnifying the wizard's voice and everything. And then Toto pulls the curtain on the wizard and, and the wizard's like, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. You know, it's trying to, it's, it's terrified that the curtain's getting pulled now. And it's trying the big skull and there's smoke and you know it's got this whole thing to try to make it seem like something to to blow it up blow itself up, but in the end it's like no no I want the peace of God I I want to know God I, I, my my journey is only for the destiny of knowing God and or hearing one voice instead of two voices you know the spirit and the ego it's the ego is made up of a phony voice to try to distract the mind. So yeah, that's 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 how we go past the ring of fear. It's really just every situation. It was like you're in the prayer of your heart, just like use me for the good of the whole. One prayer, one prayer, one prayer, and and that's what all the traditions talk about: going past temptation, past any temptation that can throw it that rears its head. Because it's just the ego trying to protect itself from being seen as nothing. Yeah. And Suzanne, you had your mm -hmm. hand up. May I ask you how, how this feels for you, like in this illusion of time being awake for more than 30 years, I think, and like walking in a world with almost everybody asleep? Well, it's, it's, it kind of, it flips from, from 
people, a person awake or people asleep and awake, it, it does all flip because Jesus is teaching us that. He's saying, when you meet anyone, remember it's a holy encounter. As you see him, you will see yourself. As you treat him, you'll treat yourself. As you think of him, you think of yourself. So it's, it comes to this kind of feeling of awakeness. That's what the celebration is like. Oh, we're all in this together. We're either all asleep or we are all awake. We have to share. It has to be a shared dream. Awakening has to be a shared dream. So it's a, it's a feeling of joy that just grows stronger and stronger and stronger. So it does feel like like a celebration, and and that's the, that's the sign of the of the celebration. It's just this feeling of joy. I know a number of times at different places in the world, and I remember we've had some amazing retreats, maybe for like a week or something at our monastery, and it's like we're just all singing and dancing and it's just starting to feel like very surreal like like it's it's like a happy party and, and it's just that that is the feeling it's not there's not a feeling of otherness with it it's a feeling of inclusive joy like like what what i proclaim for myself i proclaim for everyone and that's what jesus is teaching us it's a shared dream a happy dream is a shared dream. It, it isn't a dream where one person's happy and the rest are are in misery. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work that way. It has to be a shared dream. So, I think it was a good point in this last episode that we saw where Harry and Balama go into the generated world, and then the ego character starts right away and says, "No, if if you leave." One of these will die, you see the threat. And and then Balana is the one that answers and says, but none of this is real. So there's the there's the truthful idea. But then Harry goes, hmm, he's killed two hostages. You see the doubt thought. So they're both going in just just to go in for a quick mission and, and try to to gain some, some awareness and then leave. But when they go in, Balana says, but none of this is real. And then Harry says, oh, he's already killed too. And then, that's what Jesus is saying, it, it, takes, it takes two for there to be sickness. Mm -hmm. Jesus was just an example of, he was sure that sickness and death were impossible. So anytime anyone tried to present sickness or death to him, he didn't agree. <laughs> he didn't give his agreement to it. And that's what he says in the Course, it takes two. So really, what we're here to do is we're here to, to agree on the truth, agree on, on what's real and true, and hold that firm, and teach and learn that, strengthen that. So we're basically calling forth witnesses to that, but we're basically you know, he's, he's saying, no one is sick unless you agree to their sickness. And no one dies unless you agree to their death. Like, like our mind is so powerful, we have to go into what he calls right-mindedness or true empathy. Stay with what's real and true and don't let your mind give in to the temptation to believe there's exceptions to the truth. You know, the truth is true and nothing else is true, so you practice that every day, you know, staying in the truth. And not falling into false empathy, you know. Most of us were raised with this idea of false empathy. If somebody comes up and starts telling you their woes, you know, the ego is like, now commiserate. Oh, you poor thing. You know, it's, it's, the ego wants us to join in the error. And the title of this whole uh, retreat was Do Not See Air. It's like, stay with what's real and true. For your own sake and for the sake of everyone. Because <laughs> there's really one of us. Strengthen the truth. Stay in the, the truth of that. And, and so, oftentimes it's just kind of, of going into deep prayer or going into that inner focus. I mean, there's a lot of healing pathways 
uh, one of them I think is, is called Christian Science, and in Christian Science there's a group of practitioners, and the practitioners of Christian Science are not really like counselors, but their whole purpose is just to stay in the truth. So when someone comes to them for a treatment, the, the practitioner has only one responsibility. Stay in mind firmly to what is real and true, and do not deviate from it for a, se for a second. And then there's all these reports of miracles when it doesn't matter whether it's around body symptoms disappearing, or uh, one time someone got thrown out of the house or whatever, and they were kind of lost in a, in a city, and they called a practitioner and said, please pray with me, and then when they prayed with the practitioner, uh, somebody walked over and said, oh, can I buy you a room for the night, you know, <laughs> it doesn't even have to be a physical symptom, it could seem to be a, a circumstance that seems to involve some kind of lack or, or fear or need, and then, you know, it's, it's coming back to the prayer. So really, that's, that's what this is about, it's staying with what's real and true, and, and not joining in error. And then you do that in your mind, and then the more you practice that, you, you don't see the error. You know, it's, even with sickness, you, you don't, it doesn't matter the type of symptom, or the, the degree of the symptom, or, you know, the severity, or anything that seems to be important in the world, like gradations of psychological health, or spiritual health, or physical health, you start to just see that, oh my God, this is all a call for me to stay in right-minded perception. So that's what the path becomes. And, and in that sense, it, it is kind of a letting go, again, of all the concepts. Whatever concepts we've held of ourselves, we just have to be willing to, to let go of them. And of course, in miracles, you know, he, he'll still use concepts like miracle worker or teacher of God as, as more of like a, something to open your mind to. And even that, for most people, is like, when you start to do the Course, you know, it's saying, you know, you're a miracle worker, and, you know, most of us did not grow up thinking of ourselves as miracle workers, you know, that, that's a, kind of a, a concept that's far beyond what we saw ourselves as, but then, you know, you st start to really start to accept it. Every day should be devoted to miracles. Miracles are natural, when they do not occur, something's gone wrong. Oh my gosh! I'm a miracle worker, you know, you, you start to actually take it in. Like, oh my gosh, that's what all this mind training is for, to, it's still a concept, but it's one of those that's, that's in alignment with, with the light, in alignment with the truth. So, he does say at one point, you know, you have one vocation. Most of us think of the word vocation, we think of many things, many of us have done many things in terms of vocations in the world. What is a vocation? Vocation is like a profession, or a or a job, yeah. Most of us have, have done many jobs, and have, some of us have had multiple professions, and then, but Jesus is saying healing, healing in your mind is your vocation. So again, he takes it and simplifies it, you know, it's like, no, no. And what is healing? Healing is to make happy. That's how Jesus defines healing. To heal is to make happy. Well, imagine that if that's your only devotion, to make happy. You know, it, it takes a while to get used to that. <laughs> it does, you know, it really, it's like he's saying, to heal is to make happy, and then it's like, oh, okay, I, I, I don't know, but how? How do you do that? But obviously, if you're giving it to me, then I'm, I'm, I'm meant to be happy. You know, that's a different way of thinking of healing. Sometimes healing has connotations of the body, yeah. that's associated with it, but not so much happy. Because uh, the ego comes up with its own versions of happy too. Yeah. You know, oh, it's, you know, this and this and this, I'm going to party, and you know, 
it's got its own version. And we've tried a lot of those as well. <laughs> They're very temporary. They don't really last. They don't have a, have a lasting quality to them. But, but the more we get into our, our joy, our function of, of happiness, it, it does start to expand and, and become more and more consistent. And uh, then when somebody says, what do you, you know, uh, Suzanne, what are you going to do with your life? Uh, happy. Be happy. <laughs> but what are you going to do? Be happy. You know, <laughs> that you can actually come back. You know, it gets more strong, you know. Yeah. Because you can feel the guidance carrying you and lifting you like you were sharing earlier. You know, yeah. you've been carrying. carrying. I, I feel this, and I also feel this, this happiness most of the time, but I... And this is the thing that still hurts. I still, not always, but sometimes, and I feel the higher it goes and the more open it becomes, the more it hurts, and I still feel separate sometimes. Yeah, it's like a gap. It's, 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 and I'm it's, it's, really praying to finish this, yeah. this separateness. It's beautiful, that's a beautiful yeah. prayer. Yeah. Finish it. <laughs> that's, a, that's a beautiful prayer, yeah. And then sometimes I think, should I come up with another prayer? Everybody seems to pray about so many things. <laughs> and then I, I, I can't come up with anything else. Then only the song from Elvis Presley goes through my head, take my hand, take my whole life too, and, and this is it. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think when you when you just focus on the happiness and then if if something else other than the happiness comes up, you that's one thing we've learned from, from this retreat is don't hide it. You know. It's the hiding it that protects it. And when we don't hide it, you know, there's all kinds of egos like don't be weak, don't cry, don't you know, it's it's got a bunch of that it wants to keep it, whatever it is, you know, this upset or this separateness, it wants to hold on to that at all costs, but, but to just say it, and that's what we keep experiencing and over and over, when, when you spill the beans, when you say, ah, this is what I'm feeling, or, or whatever, but in the presence of, of I'm not going to hide it, I'm going to open it completely up, I'm not going to protect it at all, then, then it, it goes. So, that's where the trust comes in, you know. The ego saying, don't say it, don't say it, you're going to appear weak, you're going to be vulnerable. And it's like, Jesus is like, say it. <laughs> you can say it, you know. It, 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 it's, it's, it's on its way out, you know. There's a song called uh, Young at Heart, and one of the lines is, and love is either in your heart or on its way. It's just a beautiful line. Love is either in your heart or on its way. Very soft. Very soft. Yeah. Because that's that's when we line up with the light, you know. We 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 don't try to make it real and condemn ourselves. We just we don't sometimes we have to crack. Sometimes the nut has to crack. It's part of the healing, you know, so... That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.